Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Cynthia Shore, the Executive Director of the Walt Whitman Birthplace Association. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this morning to our second to the last program in our series, uh, The Legacy of Long Island Native Peoples, uh, focusing on Walt Whitman and Native Americans. It gives me great pleasure to um, welcome the Uncachuk Nation Chief, Harry Wallace. Welcome, Harry. And also to say thank you to Sandy Brewster Walker, who has the project manager and organizational of all things uh, relating to this program today and the programs past and to come. So thank you, Sandy. And I'll have more in, by way of introduction for them in a moment or two. Uh, we, this is a program series that had uh, six programs in it, and uh, our speaker today is one in a roster of notable speakers, which have included Ed Folsom, Dr. John Strong, Margaret Smith, and Dr. Linford Fisher. And next, uh, next month, we will be welcoming Lance Gums and his presentation. So we are very excited. We've covered some wonderful material about the legacy of Long Island's first people, uh, very educative, interesting, dis disarming, alarming, and hopeful. So with all of those adjectives that, that this program has brought to us, I welcome you and invite you to join us today. All right, and I guess I shall introduce Harry. So it gives me great pleasure again to welcome Harry. He's Uncachuk Nation Chief Harry Wallace. And he had a wonderful um, article in Newsday this past week about all the Native American legal uh, items that are going on. And I will let him speak to that more if he has time in his wonderful presentation today. Uh, Newsday said that when he was younger, he had a vision. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I know they also- That's a misquote, so don't say that. I won't okay. say that. But okay. uh, so, uh, but I do see here that you do have a mission to uncover the Algonquian language. And he has done that by starting a program at Stony Brook University, which is the Algonquian Language Revitalization Project. And the project, it's a result of more than a decade's worth of collaboration, has produced a language class, a dictionary, and a Native American resource library based at Stony Brook. He has been chief of the Uncachuk Nation since uh, 1994, so it's for over 25 years. And he has also taught courses at Stony Brook as part of the linguistics department, which he co uh, of the project too, which he co-founded. Uh, prior to 1994, he was in a private practice as an attorney. He's licensed in the state of New York, the federal and state courts, the Eastern and Southern districts of New York. He's been practicing law since 1983. He went to New York Law School and attended Dartmouth College as an undergraduate. He's been involved in Native American issues since his college days, actively involved, we should certainly say. He was president of the Native Americans at Dartmouth Student Organization and president of the Indian Law Committee at law school. He was a director of a comprehensive employment training program at the American Indian Community House from 1975 through 1978. He's the past vice president of the Native American Indian Education Association of New York. And he is the past president of the Intertribal Historic Preservation Task Force, which is involved in grave protection, burial site protection, sacred site protection. And presently he is a member of the Tribal Courts Forum. I would like to uh, hand over Harry to you and invite him to speak. And let's see where we are. Yes. Um, and so, Sandy, give me some guidance. Am I introducing you too, or are we introducing oh, you? Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> and then I'm going to say about five okay. minutes before Harry talks. Okay. I'm so excited to get to Harry. I, I wanted to skip you, Sandy. <laughs> I will so, know you have too long. 
So here we have Sandy Brewster Walker. I had met her years ago and through one of our board members, Tom New uh, uh, Mark Nuccio, who is here today. And Sandy um, has been very instrumental in putting this together. And I'm finding her, let's see, her biography here. Okay, get my all my letters in order. Um, she's an independent historian, genealogist, freelance writer, and business owner. She is chairperson for the Board of Trustees and acting executive director for the Indigenous People Museum and Research Institute. She has served in President William J. Clinton's administration as deputy director of the Office of Communications at USDA. Sandy is a member of the Montauk Indian Nation, an executive director and government affairs officer. In the Long Island region, she is a member of the board of directors for the Long Island Museum and the Friends of Plum Island, and the advisory board member of the Cold Spring Harbor Whaling Museums and the Friends of Connecticut River uh, State Park. I believe she's also added a couple more board members since this uh, bio was written, and she can tell you about those. In 2017, she was a winner of the Press Club of Long Island Media Award for third place for narrative column. As you can see, I know from other bios of Sandy, she's an engineer. She's extremely organized, extremely intelligent, and gives thoughtful preparation for everything that she does, not only for this series, but for anything that she's involved with. So any of the boards that she's on, uh, they count themselves lucky. And uh, I would like to present Sandy to you and say, welcome, Sandy. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I'll just mention um, that our agenda today will begin with, which we did already, with the series overview. But I'm going to talk about the speaker and the topic and why I selected it. And then I'll turn the program over to Chief Wallace. Then we'll have a Q&A. So get your questions ready, and then we'll have closing remarks and a thank you. Now, why I selected it, because Harry is the best person on Long Island to go to about the Algonquin language, whether you're looking at the history or whether you're trying to learn it. I'm more interested in the history of it than learning it. I've tried three years of Spanish and four years of uh, French, and I'm not a language person, so I stick to the history part. But what I wanted to do today, since yesterday so much took place, I needed to be around my ancestors. So I'm going to just spend five minutes talking a little bit about uh, my Montauk ancestors. And uh, there are also a number of people that are on this call call, they're also their ancestors. But this is the Fowler House. And just recently, um, I was put in charge of the Fowler House by the chief to use it to interpret um, the trial, the 1910 trial. And if you look to the right of the screen, in 1921, this is a delegation that went to Washington. And in the center, the gentleman that's sitting there, that's George Fowler. And this was his house in East Hampton. And because of what happened yesterday, the governor turning or vetoing our bill uh, for the fifth time, I needed to be around these ancestors. This is also some more pictures, the coffees from the East End. Um, and I forget the name. This is another Freetown family. So we do exist. And uh, then I came back up to the West End and the top left-hand corner, that's my grandmother. She goes back to a Fowler and his picture is the one right below her, the older gentleman standing in front of the car. He was a Fowler, one of the core families of the Montauk and Indian nation. And that's my mom's mom. And if you look to the right, you'll see that's my father's father, my grandpa Job. And the picture that you're looking at with the dahlias was actually taken from my bedroom and my sister's bedroom. And then I'm gonna take you back to the left-hand side. And I thought she should be here too. And this is Denise Shepard's mother. She was a cousin 
and she passed away this year. And then in the center, that's Uncle Bub. He might even be on the call right now, but that's Mandy's father. And I just thought I'd feel more comfortable having them with me today since I've had very little sleep because of what the governor did. She took the opportunity during Native American History Month to turn the bill down. So these are some of the people that are making me feel comfortable today. And what I'd like to do, since most of you or a number of you that are online know Chief Harry Wallace, and um, also Cynthia did a nice bio of him and reading up his bio. So what I'd like to do is turn the program over to Chief Harry Wallace. And I'm going to come out so you can put up the slides, Chief. You got to unmute too. Mm -hmm. There you go. And you can put up your slides. Okay. Aquani Tom Pak, Kiwa say a nini in a tasuis. Turupas nicha shayuan. Anka chogs kitan mede in a nina chapayawan. Who's patak nitup? Greetings, my friends and relatives. My name is Harry Wallace. Kiwa say a nini in my language, which means hunter man. I'm a turtle clan and I'm the elected chief of the Uncachog Nation and I, <clears throat> I'm a Medewan and uh, I live on Puspatuck ter Reservation, Uncachog Territory. I say this greeting in our, in our language, which is how we always greet each other when we begin, when we meet. And uh, I post here the uh, symbol of the Uncachog Nation, which is a vision which uh, from our former chief, uh, Chief Lone Honor Ebon, who had passed away in 1994, I believe, 92, uh, at, at a much too young age. But he was my mentor and a visionary, and uh, um, I began my journey shortly thereafter that. So I just want to start with thanking uh, uh, the Walt Whitman uh, Association and Sandy Walker for inviting me, Sandy Brewster Walker for inviting me to give this presentation. I was very excited about doing that, doing this. I'm still excited, but my excitement has been tempered by the uh, by the uh, terrible news of uh, the governor on it's a slap in the face on uh, his, uh, on uh, Native American. Um, 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 appreciation History Month, as well as the uh, eve of Thanksgiving for her to insult the entire Native community, the entire Indigenous community of New York, and particularly Long Island, with uh, with her um, horrific uh, uh, justification for denying Montaukett recognition. Um, so let's try and be together as friends and relatives and uh, and speak about uh, the wisdom of our people and the wisdom of our language. Okay, so uh, we'll begin with that. So the language of our people is but what we have been taught is that the language of our people is sacred. And as a member of the uh, Three Fires Medewin Lodge, which in our language is called Mishwi Skoda'awak Muta'awak, our grand chief who left us uh, two, a few years ago, always urged us to remember that the language of the people is a way to communicate with spirit. It describes our traditional ways of life. Our words reflect our values and our relationship to the natural world. It is not just a different way of speaking English. It is not a linguistic curiosity like ancient Latin, that is interesting, but irrelevant. It is also not dead. Historians, so-called Algonquinists, and governments have been trying to kill us for centuries. We and our language survived the onslaught. Our language went, as we like to say, 
underground, waiting for a time to come out in the open. That time is now. Because our language was given by spirit, it is forever. We can recover it. We can reconnect to it. It is and was never lost. And when that article came out, I said this to the reporter. And of course, reporters never get anything wrong. So it's important for you to understand that, right? <laughs> what I said to was, I was told that there were three sacred bundles, one of which was the talking stick. So when I sought my mission in life, my, I, I went to see if I could help recover and unearth that those talking sticks. And I have been dedicated to doing that. I did not have that vision. I did not have those. Uh, those did not just appear to me. I was told this information. As I was told this story by, um, by our grand chief, so I repeat this to you because this is knowledge that was given to me, and I pass this knowledge on, hopefully for our future generations who can continue to keep and hold that close to their hearts. So that's why I begin this way, so that you understand what I have been told and what I am trying to pass on to others. Okay, so um, I am not a fluent speaker yet, but neither was James Hammond Trumbull, who published the Natick Dictionary, nor William Wallace Tooker, who published the Indian place names on Long Island. I'm also not, um, my um, um, understanding of this is not colored by a philosophy that uh, people who were studying this felt superior to the people they were studying. That's called eugenics. And it's called racism. I don't have those kinds of prejudices. If you want to understand how that appears on Long Island, you can go back and listen to John Strong's story about that in a previous um, um, story here on the Walt Whitman Association. He, he was very clear on how that uh, materialized. The first uh, um, book that was ever published in the United States um, was not in English. Oops, okay. So here, before we get to that book, I wanted to show you an image. This is an artist image, Lydia Chavez. Uh, um, my daughter, you know, full disclosure, I asked her to take an artist's rendition of what we typically would have looked like during contact period. And this is her rendition. This is an artist's rendition. As you know, artists, their thought process and their imagination are different than the rest of us people. So she came up with this con compilation of what an image of a typical Uncachog or Long Island man would have looked like, and which probably would have been pretty scary to some of those folks who were just arriving from Europe. But this is the type of image and the type of way in which we thought we, we would have looked. If you read some of the um, material about uh, um, Giovanni de Verrazano's journeys here and some of the others, they tell you the images of our people and uh, this is what an artist's rendition of what we would have probably had looked like during that period of time in what in the in youth. So um, the uh, statement that I gave you in the beginning was a self-introduction. And in our way, when we identify ourselves, we don't just say hello. We don't just say, um, how are you? We first identify who we are. Then we tell them our clan or our family name. Then we also identify 
our nation, our people, or where we, who, or our, our community. And then we just tell you where we live or where we are. So in that way, anybody who's, who's concerned about who they're talking to gets a clear understanding of who we are, of who you are, and you give them that information. So when we say, my name is, or I am called, we say, Nitasuis. When we say what my clan is or my family, it's Nitsha Shayong. And when we say what my tribe is or my nation, we say Nitshapayong. And simply where I reside, Nita. I live there. And the pronunciations of those are different than they are, even though we're using it in English or a English uh, vocabulary or an English uh, alphabet, the sounds are different because what we're trying to do is recreate an oral tradition using um, English uh, alphabet. So the sound for the A, long A is ah, as in father. The sound for I is E, we never say I, we say E. The sound for the O is oo. It's almost like a double O sound. And there is a, a way we're thinking of we changing the, the O to a double O sound, a double O symbol to reflect the O sound, because that's what we're trying to recreate is the sound for O. And when we have the, um, the what they call a carrot on top of the O, the sound is a nasal O. So you would say O. And, and simply the U and the A are short vowel sounds. It would be uh, 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 almost the same, uh, uh. So everybody who want to try that today? So let's try that. Say ah, E, E, O, 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 uh, uh. Those are the sounds of our language. That's the sounds of, of who we are. Okay. So the first book in, 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 America, in North America was written in 1663, and it wasn't written in English. It was written in the, our language, the language of our people. This is the Old and New Testament. This is the Bible. It was published in 1663 by um, John Eliot, who was a minister in Massachusetts. And the reason I bring that up is because those are resources, not just of Wampanoag uh, people, but of also um, of Long Island, because his primary interpreter was a fellow by the name of Kokono de Long Island. And I'll give you three guesses of where he came from. Okay, you were right the first time. That's why he's from. He wasn't. He he understood both English and and uh, and of course his native language. And he was he was John Eliot's primary um, um, interpreter and primary uh, um, consultant in language. So what he was doing was he was also uh, the original documents were more in tune with what the language that we spoke. The later interpretations were much more into the Massachusetts dialect, but our original ones were much closer to the Long Island dialect. So they're, they're also in, important for us as resources to identify um, what our, the, the language that we spoke. Okay. okay. So um, this was the original document. It is the Old and New Testament, and it's an invaluable resource that we use. Other, use, so other resources that have been invaluable are listed here. Of course, Thomas Jefferson's tra transcript of Uncachog words, Fidelia Fielding's diary, another uh, fluent speaker, uh, Pearson's catechism, which was done in, uh, in the uh, um, Kuripi language, and Montauk at words listed by John Gardner from Montauk. Also, what the people remember. That's a, that's a source that was never not available or not looked for, but the people have their own knowledge of what the language was that has been passed down. And we've used that as an invaluable. 
um, resource. Ankachog, in a sense, is unique in that what linguists call dialectic continuum. So it has versions of uh, different dialects, or what we call R dialect, or N dialect, or Y dialect, all of those, or even L dialect, which is further north. It is a language that um, has parts of other languages that enable people to communicate with each other. A similar example of that would be, in Europe, would be what we call the Basque language. The Basque can understand French and can understand Spanish, but the Spanish can't understand the French. So they could speak to the Basque and the Basque could speak to all either one of them. That's what's called dialectic continuum. So as you travel a certain distance away, it gets more and more where you can't communicate with one another. But the Uncontrolled language has that ability to absorb both of those in historically. Same thing with the Fez in Morocco, the native people of Morocco. They have the ability to speak Arabic and speak European languages, and the two languages can't communicate with each other. So um, the other resources I wanted to point out that are very important to us is the Roger Williams, the key to the language of America, and uh, Joseph Laurent's Abenaki in English dialogues. Both of these, both of these were men were fluent speakers. So their 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 written documents are, are invaluable in that they were trying to write in the best way they could the, what these sounds were in the language. And they were fluent speakers. So they were they were much more adept at that than Tucker or uh Trumbull. Um and I'll tell you why I think it, uh, Abenaki is included in that is because in the diary of Elise Eliezer Wheelock, who was the founder of Dartmouth College and Moore's uh, Indian School in, in Connecticut before that, he wrote in his diary that uh, when uh, Jacob Fowler went to uh, Dartmouth to teach he was Jacob Fowler being, of course, a uh, Montaukett who went to Moore's uh, Indian School in Connecticut. He was a teacher there from the boys from St. Francis. That is the Abenaki uh, where um, Joseph Laurent comes from. They call Odenak, uh, um, they, they call, which means in our language, town, simply means town. But in the English, it was called St. Francis. And that's over in Ontario, in, uh, in Canada, uh, or um, Quebec, sorry, not Ontario. But he found that, this is in 1769, he found that the boys from St. Francis who spoke Abenaki speak nearly the same language with his nation, which is Montauk, if you can read this here, All right? And that with very little pains, he can preach freely to them and consequently to many large tribes far distant in their own tongue. So we use that as a reference because we know that there originally were some very close similarities in communication because it is an Algonquin-based language. So in Jefferson's words, what we have done in the modern um, context is to use uh, his, his phonetic spelling and try to come up with the modern usage of using the syllables that we have adopted in our modern concepts and look up the real definitions and may be more clear in the definitions. So we, we had some students at Stony Brook who helped uh, uh, begin this, and we have his word, the modern usage, the def TJ's or Thomas Jefferson's definition, and the modern definition, and then also breaking it down to what's called animate and inanimate, you know, because that tells you how to conjugate how to interpret, how to, how to put words together. So this is very important. 
and whatever other notes that were there uh, that were there. So we take, for example, the first word, Anasas, which is in Jefferson's list. Modern usage is Anasas. Jefferson uses bird, but it really means hummingbird. Okay. And it's a na because it's a living thing. Same thing with the next word, awasas, which is in his language, which is in his word usage, uh, word uh, list, rather. The next word is awas, awash. It, he has it listed as bird, but it really means hawk, type of bird it is. And now we get that and understand that. So we have those, we, we've broken it down into those um, uh, more understanding that as we go along. Uh, the word, um, I, I find these two here interesting. If you can see my my the word for uh, he's referring to war because at this time in 1791, when he came, he was concerned about different, uh, you know, the, the, the prospect of war with Native people. And so the interpretation of that is that it's a war and it's a new word. But when he asked them about the war in Massachusetts, he, he wrote a different word. And it is my belief that the reason he wrote a different word, because the people... The same word, whether it's war in Massachusetts, war in New York, war in Long Island, it's the same word. Ayita Yowak. Ayita Yowonk. Ayita Yowonk. He said they said the same word, but Jefferson listened more carefully when it was war in Massachusetts than in what he thought was a generic word. So he got it better with war in Massachusetts than in the generic word for war. Okay, so I find it to be curious to me because, you know, it depends on what he's looking for, because he was looking for words that he, that were important to him and not necessarily important to us. Okay, so um, and what's not here is the words that we use in our own communities, okay, which are would not be necessarily something that we would have shared from some from other people, but would have been those things that were part of our way of life passed down from generations. Okay, so in two thousand and nine, I was part with uh, Chichi um, Elizabeth Hale. Um, to co-found the Algonquin Language Revitalization Project. It was revitalized, it was again restarted in 2016, but the original project was begun in 2009, and it was with members of the Ankachog, Montaukit, and Shinnecock Nation. And we began trying, we were doing classes there. Our instructor at the time was a Mohegan, woman by the name of Stephanie Fielding. And she was, uh, I can't say enough about her contribution to beginning this. She was, she was a linguist. She was a, um, a, a degree in uh, a linguist and she began to translate her ancestor Fidelia Fielding's um, uh, diary and uh, using all the sources that were available to her at that time. And she was she was tremendously helpful in us getting this project off the ground. Okay. And uh, as a result of the work that was done, we began to create this document. We are still working on this. We do this every Monday. There might be some people in the class that are in that thing. I see Shelly. Ripa Mikwan, she's a member of our dictionary workshop group. I don't know who else is involved, who else might be on this list, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, there are about seven of us who every Monday, 
we go through our dictionary, we edit, we we add, we subtract, we you know, multiply and divide all of the words of the language there. Okay, so as as much as we go, and I and I drafted this and, and, and acknowledged, I've actually changed this to acknowledge all the people in the dictionary workshop group. And uh we have um so I give everyone their credit. The original document was prepared by Stephanie Fielding with the assistant, my assistants, <clears throat> and it's prepared for the people, not for school, not for a uh, institution, it's not for a particular government, it's prepared for the people. It's the language of the people, and that's why we prepare it. So ultimately, we will have this published, and uh, we're excited about its publication for the future. So let's talk about some words. Okay. Um, I've started with three, three words that I think are important. The importance of understanding these words are in our language because they have been so um, misunderstood and misused that it is important in order to understand how the language is sacred and in order to understand how important language is to our way of life, you, we need to change our understanding of how we use these, the words on general and in these words in particular. So I've picked out matuak, homoaki, and so on our key. And uh, I wanted to start first with understanding that in our language, H is rarely pronounced in English, but in our language, it is always pronounced. And it's like taking a breath. When you use the H, it's mutah uak. It is pomo aki, aki. It is siwa. Aki, so on, aki. So it's like taking a breath, but you always sound that. English, the words in the um, that are used in the uh, colonial interpretation almost always leaves out that sound. So you have to restore that sound to get an essence of why that word is important. Okay. So why is this important? Because if we don't understand the meanings of these words, the false interpretations perpetuate a racist stereotype and the denigration of the way of life of the people. And I will tell you that exactly how that works. And let's start with Pomoaki. And I say this because Whitman was very much a fan of Pomoaki, right? That was one of his favorite words, right? He popularized it, right? But it is a total misunderstanding of what he under, what he knew it to be, because he used it as uh, these are all various spellings of it. But in our language, the word pomoaki means my my belief is that it meant pomoaki meant the land of the sea spirit, because it's the word pomo, pomo or pamo was found in everyone's dictionary, but it was rarely used and almost always in a compound format. It usually refers to the sea, and it is hard to find in the dictionaries because it rarely stands alone. The word for sea singularly is kito or kitan. But if you look in the dictionary and under sea or ocean, you will find pomo, as pomo aki, as the land of the sea spirit. Now, the reason why I say this is because Whitman and uh, Tooker reflected the word as Pomanaki as land of tribute. And being uh, was, uh, the word uh, for tribute being um, Pomon, that there is that it was describing a servitude way of life. And that way of life did not exist on, in, on Long Island. 
There is no servitude in this way of life. There is no forced domination of one over the other. There is no denial of economic self-sufficiency and subsistence. This is the law of nations. Okay, and we'll get into that in a second. But it comes from a story that uh, an agreement was made with the uh, Montaukett chief, who was the chief of Pomanoc. And they understood that to be a um, subsistence, uh, submission of a subsistence um, um, lifestyle. But it's not that. It was simply the word used to describe with the, the land of, upon which he, this particular chief had, um, had jurisdiction. Had authority. It's not it was not considered a, a place of servitude. And the reason why I also say that and believe that because our former chief, my mentor, Lone Otter, he has an unwritten manuscript and he calls it the Turtle People of Spirit Island. And this is the words that he used. Right? So we hope to eventually edit and publish this uh, manuscript with permission from his family. But the words he used to describe Spirit Island was Pomoaki. So this is our tradition that neither Trumbull, Tooker, nor Whitman, for that matter, would have been aware of and would have had access to. But we are, and we were. The other thing I can explain to you why it's important is because during the uh, an earlier writing in 1655 by Adrian van der Donk from uh, called the uh, the description of New Netherland describes how we lived and how we governed and in his book it says of all the rights laws and maxims observed anywhere in the world none in particular is enforced among these people other than the law of nature and or of nations. Now, this is not just a, uh, you know, a nature, law of nature is a, is a uh, legal, uh, lawyers like to say it's a term of art. It meant that under the um, um, understanding of what that meant, the, uh, the law of nature um, was a concept that was known as uh, that people would come together and create a system of governance that was acceptable to all of those who were under its control. That's the concept of law of nature. It's not just, uh, you know, the, only the strong survive. That's a much more, that is an absolute not understanding of what it means. And Vanderdunk, would have gotten that from a, a Holland, uh, uh, from, from, from being an educated man. He would have understood that because he, the teachers in Holland at that time were promoting that, that theory of uh, the law of nature. And he would have understood that. So for him to recite that in his book of, New, um, of, the, of the description of New Netherland, he would have understood that concept of the law of nature as it was explained to him in his teachings as an educated man. So I, re I recommend this book for everyone to read that. It's been translated twice. The first time it was mistranslated in modern Dutch. And the second time it was retranslated into the colonial Dutch because even Dutch language changes over 400 years. So I would recommend uh, everyone get a chance to read that. I would also recommend The Island at the Center of the World by Russell Shorto because he also describes the, the relationship that we had in 17th century as at a time when Indians and Europeans were something like equal participants, dealing with one another as allies, competitors, and partners. Quite a different description than what you would get in today's uh, historical understanding. Okay. Quite a different understanding of what the relationships were like. All right. And to describe what we have a way of describing the law of nations, nations and the law of nature. It's called the dish with one spoon belt. 
this is the what this is the law that governed this territory this is the law that still governs this territory and so when you see this information and you have this knowledge you understand that this is how we spoke and this belt says that if you come in peace you are welcome to uh, to to live in our land you can share in our resources but take only what you need so long as you live in peace. If you come in violence, then none of that is available to you. This is the law that governed this territory. So I'm always uh, angered by people that say our people didn't understand possession of land to the exclusion of all others. We absolutely understood that. Our agreements reflect an understanding that you cannot possess land to the exclusion of all others. What we did is chose not to live that way. That's the difference. And knowing this, every time there was an agreement that was written and here's, written, and here's the real history of our language, whenever it was a written agreement, there was always some wampum attached to that agreement because that's the way we understood it. And that's the way um, the English understood their written word. We understood the wampum. In the 1800s, all the wampum was removed from these uh, written agreements, and all that was left was the writing. The only thing that was left was the English interpretation of the agreement, not the Native people's, Indigenous people's interpretation. That was discarded in an effort to change history. Okay, so understanding Pomanaki, do we have a better understanding of Pomanaki now? Okay, so when I ask you, does Pomanaki mean land of tribute? You're going to say what? No. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to. Okay. So you're going to say, Walt Whitman, he's a great man, but he didn't understand that. <laughs> okay. So let's go to Matawak. There are various spellings all over. It's all over the place. Okay, but what it translates to, to us is the way of the heart. Okay. And uh, down on the bottom here, we have, uh, oops, <clears throat> on the bottom, you have da, means heart in our language. Ode, uh, Ode means uh, heart in Ojibwe. We have, uh, so when they say Medewin, they mean the way of the heart. When we would say that, it would be Mata'awak. Okay. And Tucker, he uses, he calls it land, the, the periwinkle uh, or the ear shell. And that's not far off because the way that is, the way of the heart, reflects our understanding of the creation of man. And we, those people of the way of the heart, those that use the shell, was vital in, this, in our story of creation, of man, how the creator used the shell to deflect his power of his breath so that man could be created. So when he has this understanding on there, probably not knowing why he understood that, but it has that reflection of what it's, why it's important in our story of creation, why it's important that we describe ourselves this way. Okay, so we weren't known as Shinnecock or Uncachog or Montaukit. We weren't known as Matinecock. We were known as Matawak. That's what we call ourselves. These designations of, of, our, of our tribes today that we use were places, and they designated those places as the people of those locations, so that it was easier for them to do deals and make agreements. Okay. And here is the ancient map, 1770, oops, 1779 map of Long Island. I'm gonna try and shrink that a little bit, I guess. Huh? Okay. Can you see that here? Ancient, Villages of the Matawa. Can you see that? Or oh, I have to move it over. Yeah, we right. can. Yeah, we can see it. All right. It's kind of big. 
ancient settlement of the Matawak Indians. That's what it was in 1779. Okay, this is an ancient map. Okay. And I wanted to show you that to show to say that. And it covers, it goes all the way. This this description goes all the way from the middle of Suffolk County all the way to uh, Montauk. That's how we know ourselves. Okay, so let's go to the next one. All right. And let's go to Siwanaki. Another one I think is uh, mis misunderstood. Okay. Um, and the reason why it's important to go back to the original documents of deeds and agreements is because it is first contact people attempting to translate our language and using phonetics from what they heard, what they understood, or what they thought they heard. So it's important to go back to these original documents, not the uh, much later iteration of the word itself, because it tells you what they thought they heard, and it gives you a better understanding of what is being reflected. So Siwanaki is used to describe a portion of Long Island as the land of the black shells. You going by what the um, um, the Dutch would call Siwan, and Aki, of course, being uh, place or land, and it's referring to the wampum. Now we know how we have some of the best wampum in the world. That's true, but I don't believe that that's what the reflection was. It could be, but I don't think it to be that. Because I look at the old iteration of Siwanaki and it's in the Bible. And the way it's described in the Bible is Siwanaki. And if you look at that word, that doesn't refer to a shell. That refers to a, la a location, a, a direction. Zowan or Siwan, Siwanaki, Siwan. Uh, it refers to the words for south. And this word would reflect southern lands. And because there are so many ways of describing us, this would be somebody asking someone else, who are these people? And they would reply, those are the people of the southern lands. And if the first settlements were in that, in that direction north of us, that's how they may have described us. Just like the word for Sioux is not a Lakota word. It's a French word. Chippewa is a French word. Iroquois is a French word. It is a name given by others to describe different people. So I believe is with this word. Siwanaki, Zowanaki. Okay. And that's why looking at the earlier documents is important. So I'm not going to say it doesn't mean that. I'm going to say I am more confident and more more confident in the logic that this reflects um, a description that someone else was giving to our people. Southern land. Okay. So let's go over some of the uh, other words. How much time do we have? We're, uh, we're, we're we have good. about you... another 15 minutes. What's that? Another what? About another 15, 20 minutes. 15, 20 minutes? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I, I tried to do some of the, um, uh, you know, just for the class, uh, some interpretations of uh, words that are common in our area. And of course, start with Uncle Chog, right? All right. So Uncle Chog, Uncle Chog is people from beyond the hill. We're reflecting the word unqua in our language, which means at the far end. Simply means at the far end. And ag is always at the place, the place of. So unqua or anunqua at the far end. So it's reflecting 
the understanding that if it's at the far end, it is beyond the hill. And if you look at a geological map of Long Island, there's a mound in the center, and we are at the far end of that mound. Okay, and we're the closest, you know, furthest out from the ocean than anybody else. Okay, and the word for our territory, our land, Huspatuk, uh, where the waters meet, is uh, it's a reflection of also. There is a, that is a very common word. There's a, there's a word for Puspatuck in uh, in Maine, in Connecticut, in Rhode Island, and they all are almost identical locations. There's the uh, creek on one side, a river on the other, and a bay that joins them. So it describes, and it's a tidal where uh, where the water rises and flows with the tide. It is a very common. Um, Location. It is where a lot of life is uh, is begins, and it's a very common area. So uh, there used to be a place back in the day where people used to say "Poos Paddock." I believe it's pro the inflection is right. I just think that the sound for the "ah" is incorrect. But you know, I can't tell anybody that because they'll get mad at me. But I believe the reflection is correct. It's just the way that we sounded the ah is different. Okay. All right. So, and it's a good, very good place to build a village with that kind of life. And we, uh, we've been on this location. We have never left. We've been on it for thousands of years. We've always occupied this territory and we've never left it. But there are also also descriptions, and remember I told you how difficult it was for Englishmen to pronounce a, a, the H? And here's a classic word right here. There's a description of the, uh, whoops, go back. Description of one, the deed to uh, the South Bay or the, uh, um, the bay where uh, Smith Point is located. <clears throat> And it's it's spelled this way, E-N-O-U-G-H. Now, if we were to pronounce that today, that would be enough, right? Enough, comma. But that's not what's being attempted here. What they're trying to do is pronounce the sound for H. So it would be enough, comma. Or anumqua. At the far end of the tidal water. Atoka uh, refers that to a fishing place. I'm not so sure, but uh, I put it in parentheses with a question mark just to say that could very well be that. But the sound would not be enough. It would be enough. Enough or enough. E would be anakwa. Anakwanak. Which is the same base for the word for unkwa, unkachog to begin with. Okay. So you have Anukwa and Amok. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. The next word um, on that map of, uh, on that deed or agreement was the word Kichi Mani Chok. Kichi Mani Chok, Kichi Mani Chok. Also a catch him in if you know that area. That's in that area over there. Now, Tucker says that this was the starting place, but it's the only time he uses Kichi to reflect word the word to start. And this is why I say he has that, um, I'm a better than you, I'm more superior than you are philosophy, because in every other way, he uses Kichi to refer to the word for great. And that's what it means. Kichi Maniru. Uh, the word is Gichi. There's all kinds of references to Gichi as great. But when it comes to this particular location, he changes great to mean start, beginning. And so I say, well, if it's Gichi, why, is it, why isn't it great? My understanding of that word is Gichi uh, or Gichi means great. The mean part is spirit. And of course, Oki means land. So if you break it down the way I understand it to be, I could be wrong because I'm not a fluent speaker yet. But if I'm consistent, 
then that place means great spirit land. That's and and I'm as my guess is as good as his. Right? So if that's great spirit's land, then that means you all are in trouble because you're abusing the great spirit's land. So keep that in mind. Okay. So also, the translation for um, the river, we go on hot duck. And that's very, it's not crooked. Because if you look at the geological location, you know what river this is? Anybody give take a guess what river this is we're talking about here? Yeah, Anybody? Forge River. Forge River. It's Christmas. We go hot duck. We got that. Means it's not crooked. If you look at it, it's a straight run. So his interpretation is a crooked river. No, it's not. But we gone is we gone or we gone means good. And hot duck is tidal river. Good river is what it translates to. That's what it used to be. It's a combination. It joins the fresh water with the salt water. There's the abundance of life, fish, shellfish, animal life, beaver, raccoon, all kinds of uh, um, place. Uh, it's where the Pushmatuck territory uh, uh, what, uh, is adjacent to. That's the river, the tidal river that connects to that area. And in my understanding of that, is it means good river. We're going to talk. It's not good anymore. That's what it was. Hopefully we can restore that by putting the natural life back to where it was, if we can. But that's what that means. And of course, the names for our nations and our people, others, Shinnecock uh, took her interprets that to be at the level land. But um, if we look at the word Asinika, in Ojibwe, means lots of stones. And Hasinika is what I understood they would, uh, they would, they described uh, that location. It would mean at the stony place. And the word sun means, uh, sun means stone in our language. Sitak, sitak, meaning the foot or between, between uh, or, or the foot, and Atuk Akut is the tidal river, tidal water. So either at the foot or between the waters of the rivers. Okay. Montauk, Miantaka, Miantaka, also at the Ford Place. I believe that's pretty, pretty, pretty standard, pretty clear, right? Um, and if I'm wrong, please tell me, Sandy, because I don't want to be in trouble with you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Matinecock word is really a, a derivative from uh, Natiniyao, which means he searches for him. And the uh, place is, uh, um, Ak is the place or uh, for it's it's commonly known as a lookout place. And the root of that is not Tini Yao, to look out. He searches or he looks out. Okay, and that is uh, the location of that over there um, at Little Neck Bay. Okay. And uh, I picked out this one because of its common usage here, Masa Piqua. Masa Piqua. Um, and uh, it, it means that the great water and the location of where that town is was actually not where the cove is. The cove is on the North Shore. So they just picked that name because they didn't want to be known as South Oyster Bay. So they changed their name to Massapequa, the town did. But its origin comes from the North Shore, the great cove, the great water. And it's common if you go, there's another town that has that name and another people that take have taken that name and it's called Masipi. 
Do you have any idea who they are? Can you name them? Mm-hmm. It's called Mashpee. Mashpee Wampanoag. It's the same word. Same word, just pronounced in a in a different way. Masipi. They call themselves Masipi. Okay. And of course, Gardner's Island, pick that out. It's about Machu Naki. Machu is sick. Sick or literally the sick land or suffering place. That's where the island, the Gardner's Island is. Okay. So I believe. Okay, so um what I wanted to do is to uh I could probably take on some questions there, but I wanted to thank you all for that opportunity. And given that we're close to this opportunity to speak with you, given that we're close to uh, Thanksgiving, I wanted to send out a, a, a greeting, my greeting of Thanksgiving, what we call Wirayuk, Kipuna Nawukanak. Now, if you look at that word, that's where the word Nunawa comes from, which is the great harvest, right? The harvest time. But apparently, according to the governor, this is what Thanksgiving means to us, right? So that's my uh, that's my take on everything here today. So we are uh, we are yuk kipuna wonkanok. Happy Thanksgiving. Yep, you might want to have Harry, everyone, kind of unmute and say the word too, and say the happy Thanksgiving before we do question and answers. Just it looked like some people were trying to say some of the language anyway. You could he repronounce it? Yeah, could you, Harry? Could you repronounce it for them, and they could say it with you. Uh, the word, okay, Thanksgiving? Yes. Yep. You share that? Yep. Okay. Um, see. Uh, um, let me find it for you. Okay. We ra yuk. We ra yuk. We we ra yuk. We ra yuk. 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 Keep on the wong. Like start from the back. Go like this. Nuk. 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 Kanuk. Kanuk. Wonk a nuk. Wonk a nuk. Na wonk a nuk. Na na wonk a nuk. Na na wonk a nuk. Pun na na wonk a nuk. Pun na ma wonk a nuk. Keep on the wonk a nuk. Keep it now. Where are you? Keep it now. Requires a lot of practice. Harry, okay. the, te- Harry, the uh, text in the language isn't on the screen. The what? The text for the language for Happy Thanksgiving is not on the screen. It's the oral tradition. Oh, you want me to share it with you? Yeah, like just so the one that you had before that had. Happy Thanksgiving in the language on the screen so we can follow it. Oh, that one? That you one. Have it now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you have Nuk, Kanuk, Wonkanuk, Na Wonkanuk, Nana Wonkanuk, Keeper Nana Wonkanuk, Keeper Na Wonk, Keeper Nana Wonkanuk, sorry. Keeper Nana Wonkanuk. Keeper Nana Wonkanuk. Keep on the we, we harvest, right? Happy we are yuk. Happy we, all of us, you and I, we are yuk. Happy we harvest. Keep on the now walking up. Keep on the now walking up. We would never say that, so it's really made up, you know, combination, because we would never say happy, happy harvest and all that. But 
And this is my version of Happy Thanksgiving between the Indian and the white. <laughs> it's a lot of our oh. Okay. Yep. Are there any questions? Yes. Any questions? Yes. Go ahead. Sir, go ahead. Uh, I remember reading that the three greatest concentrations of Native Americans uh, were around what they call the Chesapeake Bight, which are the shallow waters, the New York Bight, and the Seattle Bight. The staple of the diet was not so much fish, but shellfish. And I noticed with a lot of the place names, there are a lot of terms that refer to shells, either as shells like, uh, uh, or metaphorically, like the periwinkle shell being the uh, the spirit and the uh, uh, and whatnot. So, a lot. There's a lot of terms. I was looking at the uh, list you put up on screen for oyster. It's a punahak. Um, so, how much connection is there with the uh, place names to uh, to shells? The shell is a very important um, being. It's more than just food, and that's what you understand by knowing the language. It's more than just something that we eat and consume. It is a, has spiritual power and significance. We are all the people of the shell. Because the shell in itself is the animals there, first of all, the, uh, the, the oyster and the clam, as you know, you may or may not know, consumes or sifts through 15 to 30 gallons of water a day, each one. And what they're doing is they're filtering out and, and covering the toxins that they encounter. And they put a coating over that toxin so it doesn't harm themselves. And it breaks down the chemical toxic, uh, uh, toxic chemical and filters it back into the water clean. So by over harvesting oysters and clams, we've actually destroyed our, eco our water ecosystem because We've prevented those animals from doing their work. So we've also destroyed the good water that we that we are, that you would come to uh, uh, to um, consume. Secondly, it's the shell in of itself is part of the creation of man, as I've said before. It was it's in our story of creation. The shell had volunteered its life in order to help create the uh, man on this earth. And third, it is also a place where the medicine that we, uh, that we use in our way is gathered. So what you throw away as, uh, as waste and uh, garbage is actually a very significant and powerful element in our, um, uh, in our life. So it's more than simply food. So yes, there is a lot of words that reflect shell. There's a lot of words that reflect what is surrounding and on there because we are taught that all living things have spirit. And understanding that there are living things to have spirit is understanding how our way of life. And so that's why I say our language is more than just simply words and a translation of English. It reflects a way of life and our relationship to the natural world. We have another question too. Um, we have a question from Albert Miller, the third, I think. Okay. It, uh, yes. Um, what's the significance of the turtle clan uh, in the language? And what is it you're trying to convey in the greeting when you say that? Well, the turtle clan is reflect, the way we govern ourselves is, first of all, the turtle is a very powerful image in our way of life because we say that the, all of the land upon which we live is called Turtle Island. And it was created, uh, the land, the story is, is that it was, cre the land was created on the back of a turtle. So uh, the, the, the turtle's existence is very powerful in a spiritual way and in our story of of how the land was created for use by 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 human beings, and so when you say and and our government was 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 uh, guided by various clans, and all clans serve a particular function in the in the organization of community. 
There are clans who are leadership clans. There are clans who are who represent external affairs. There are clans who represent internal affairs. There are clans that represent um, mediation of disputes. And the turtle clan is one of those very powerful clans because it reflects uh, a way in which people come together. So all of these particular uh, represent, uh, there are hunter clans, there are planting clans, there are those of uh, medicine clans, the mukwa, the wassos, the bear, it's a medicine clan. So all of those things reflect how society is organized and comes together. So having a clan system is a system of organization. And I'll tell you something else, the clan mothers are the ones who are leaders of those clans. And they're the ones who picked the chiefs. So uh, it took America until 1920 to allow women to vote. Women have been voting in our culture since the beginning of time. Great point. <laughs> so. um, uh, Kay also had a question. Who? Kay, are you still there? Can't hear you. Wait, go ahead. Kay, can you unmute? Yes, there, I got it. Um, oh, okay. The name of the river, uh, Wigonathuk, took. Um, I couldn't catch the modern name that you said it, what it was. It means a uh, good river, not crooked river. Good river, yes. Uh, and you said it was referring to a modern river, and, and I didn't catch that. Oh, I said the 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 the, the word we gonna. I think you were referring to Puspatuck, right? Puspatuck. Oh, you know? okay, maybe right? I thought it was we gonna tuck. It's a common place in our language. There are other places that we use that word to describe the location because it's a very common and very powerful place to live because it has fresh water, salt water connection to a bay connection to a river connection to a creek is a cut and it's and the waters are tidal waters so they they go up and down with the tide so it's a reflection of type of that. things that would live in that kind of an environment are a tremendous overabundance eels clams shellfish right ocean fish all of those things freshwater fish they would all be a part of that um, um, ecosystem. And uh, if we find something like that, we want to live there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we also have a question from Phil, which happens to be Mo Hunter's nephew. If uh, you might know Mo, known Mo. Go ahead, Phil. You have to unmute, Phil. He's having problems unmuting. <laughs> uh, while we're waiting for Phil to unmute, does anyone else have a question? Any questions? I do. I and I do too. All yeah. right. Okay, Mark, and who was the other one? Uh, Cynthia. Oh, okay. Mark, hey, Cynthia, you, you go. go. First, and then Cynthia. Okay. I would like to know how far geographically could the Long Island native language be understood and used back and forth with, let's say, the Delawares or going all the way uh, mm -hmm. further west or south, et cetera, and up to Canada? Well, Algonquin is the root, and Algonquin languages are spoken all the way across to the west coast. So would they be able to understand that? most likely, at least some of it. But I do know that uh, um, the, it, it, the language was understood in Maine, in Canada, um, the Ojibwe. Our, our grand chief understood when I spoke the language of my people. He understood what I was talking about. He understood what I said. And uh, so, and he was, he was a born a fluent speaker. And he learned the language from his grandparents. So the, the, the language that he spoke was the language of the ancient people. And uh, um, I, would, I would say, and he used to say that uh, the, we are all the people of the shell. 
And the people of the shell, the furthest east is, of course, uh, you know, Long Island. And the furthest west was uh, uh, the uh, what they call Omaha people uh, who are settled in, uh, in Nebraska. Okay. You call them Omaha, but they call themselves Omaha. Like you call Ohio, it's really Ohio. Because I tell you, we don't have the I sound, we have the E sound. So it's Ohio. And Cynthia, you have a question? I did. Um, you know, my background is literature and I've taken a linguistics courses. So there's so many questions I could ask. But as you opened with uh, the comment that words reflect our values, of course, we certainly agree with that. And in my classes, um, we uncovered that not only it's the words, but the syntax, you know, the word placement, the word order uh, reflects values. And in the English language, the word that's valued more is in the first place, especially with opposites. So if you have up and down, in and out, you know, it's better to be in than out, it's better to be up than down. And I was just wondering, um, and this also extends, of course, to the whole um, gender of language, which I studied, you know, the man and woman, boys and girls, and Mr. and Mrs., that is reflecting a value in the word order. Did, did you find anything uh, similar or is there anything similar in the Algonquin language? Um, Two things about that, if I might. First is that we have been taught that new information comes first. So when I say uh, Harry, uh, Natasawis, Harry is what I am called. You can say Natasawis Harry, but we're taught that new information comes first. Okay. okay. And the other thing is the Algonquin language is, is, is not gender specific. He and she are the same word is used to describe he and she. So you don't have a distinction. It's not a hierarchical. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you don't have a dominant and a subordinate um, uh, classification in the language. Interesting. Right, so if you want to say, uh, you know, what I, uh, you know, uh, um, how is that person, right? Wurak, right? No, no, um, you, uh, not you, Wurak, but that's unhappy. But if you were to say that, it would be, how is that person he, or how is that person she? It would be the same words. Okay, okay. thank you. Cynthia, you have another question? You wanna we got time for a second one from you. Um let's see. No, I think that's fine. I mean, a lot of it gets a, a bit more technical. Um Okay. Well, I guess Deborah, you know, Deborah, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, Deborah, you have a question? Yeah. Uh can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Um so uh, Chief Wallace, thank you for your talk. Um, I learned a lot. And um, one question I have, or my question is, um, you made a really interesting distinction that I had um, like never heard. And it gave me a lot to think about um, in your discussion of um, the Pamanok, when you, um, you know, said the, the idea of like, you know, the general, the idea that Native Americans somehow did not understand land possession, um, as opposed to you saying that like, in fact, they did um, at the time, but just refused to um, practice it in the way that the you know colonists did. So um, I had never like quite thought of it that way because in a lot of my um, studies and my understanding is like you know this um, you know this idea of this there being these very different like knowledge systems when it comes to land possession. And I really like um, what you're you know suggesting with that because I think there's a more kind of like empowering you know, um, I don't know, way of, um, you know, framing this discussion. And I guess I'm just wondering if you think that over time, historically, the idea of um, somehow that Native Americans lacked that um, understanding of land um, as something that can be possessed, uh, if, the, if that contributed, that idea that they somehow just didn't understand it versus refusing it, um, contributed to um, justifying um, Native Americans as somehow um, somehow that it contributed to oppression or justification of that oppression like in what way you think that way of under you know 
if you think that that in and of itself contributed to inequality? Well, I, I, I'm not sure I understand your question, but let me try to answer, uh, answer to you. There was clearly an understanding of exclusive possession of ownership. Mm -hmm. you, the first, you need to accept that. Okay. Then there's a question if you look at every agreement, and I haven't found one yet where the agreement does not say that the native people agree to uh, 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 that you can live in this area, but we reserve for ourselves the right to hunt, the right to fish, and the right to plant. And what does that tell you? It tells you what? That your possession is not exclusive. Mm -hmm. okay. That's what it tells you. You look at all the agreements that I have seen, and they all reserve the right to plant, to hunt, and to fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, and women were important in, in these agreements. They were always a part of the uh, um, negotiations because they knew where all the medicines were. And so they preserved those areas specifically because there were medicines that were needed for the health and well being of the community. All right, so there is no stranger of possession. It is, you, you, the agreements did not include exclusive possession. So that's when we say that's when you took the land because if you deny a possession for the use of hunting and fishing, and what you have done is that you have appropriated that land for your exclusive use against the law. And that's why they got rid of all the wampum belts associated with every agreement, because we interpret it that way, and you interpret it on the written page. Because there's always two sides to an agreement. And if we weren't writing in English, we were certainly using a different method of recording our what we understood the agreement to be. That's a very good point. Um, thank you, Harry. I'm going to turn the program over to Cynthia for closing remarks. Okay, well, I certainly want to echo Sandy's thanks, Harry. It was a wonderful presentation and I think we should all have a round of applause and we can show it with our clapping. It's wonderful, wonderful. Um, I did have other questions like, do, does the Algonquin language have idioms, but it, it gets very, you know, technical and we want to proceed with um, our closure today, but uh, maybe I'll email you some of my rest of my questions. <laughs> um, uh, one thing, is the dictionary for sale that we can buy it and support a cause or what yeah. is the state of the dictionary? Okay, the state of the dictionary is that we're looking for... Um... Um, uh, publication, and uh, we're looking for online, um, you know, people to, to help us do that work. And uh, once that's done, it will be, we'll try to make it accessible online, and certainly publish it and have it accessible for purchase. Okay, we are editing it. And I see uh, Awipa Mikwan is on this um, call. So she is one of those in our dictionary workshop. Um, we, I, we call her Wipamikwa and you call her Rochelle. She is on our workshop and we work every Monday, every Monday uh, to make sure we correct and edit and, and, and go forward with it. And right now, Shelly, what are we up to? We're up to like 150 words, pages rather than words, pages plus another 50 pages in the English translation. So we got about 200 and some pages in the dictionary thus far. Plus we have a, uh, uh, what's it called? A glossary that gives us um, um, uh, conjugations and and, uh, and not and knee, um, uh, end word endings. So we're constantly expanding those, uh, those documents and uh, Bringing, it, bringing the language alive to the modern world. So like I said, we, the language is not dead. Don't, I don't want to hear any of this. 35 people in here, there's 35 people in Long Island who are bound to say to anyone they meet, our language is not dead. We are just, we are reconnecting to it and, we, and it is coming to alive and now is the time to bring it back to, oh, to life once again. And I'm holding all 35 of you now to this 
to this obligation and responsibility to no longer speak in that way. And if I hear you say that in that way, we're going to have a problem. Okay. Do you have an email that we could? Uh, uh, yeah, I have an email. Um, I was, I'm thinking of changing it, but uh, it's right now it's uh, HWAL, the number one, at AOL.com. I've had that since the beginning of time, but now I need to change it to a more different one. But for now, that'll serve as my uh, as my communication. Yeah. Okay. HW uh, at LI. Oh, H W A L. Okay, sorry. At number one yeah. and the number one. H W A L the number one. At AOL dot com. Yeah, but Cynthia, before you close, I Bob put up his hand. If you have a quick question, Bob, and then we go back to Cynthia. It's in the chat. Oh, it is? The email's in the chat. Oh, okay. Well, Bob, can you unmute? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. I can hear you, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, is there a hand signal or a word you can say to us that we can repeat to you to say many thanks instead of just clapping? Uh, not that I know of. But, uh, okay. But uh, but there is a whole language of signals that comes from the West Coast. There's a whole con that because they were used in treaty negotiations. I don't know them. I only know a few of them that was in our class, uh, but none of them for clapping because we didn't really clap. We kind of yelled a lot, but we didn't do a whole lot of clapping. You know? That's you know? what I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, Thanks so much. Uh, we wouldn't stand there and clap, you know, and uh, oh, how good that is. We would uh, give a shout, you know, but uh, I can give you a couple of those, but I don't know if you might wake you up a little more. You know. <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to. All right. I would like to say one more thing before Sandy. Okay. And then we're going to go to Cynthia. Go ahead, right. And that is this. After what happened yesterday, uh, I guess all of us feel and that it was a travesty and I hope that the fight will continue. It will. It will eventually be successful. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mark. Another uh, conversation I've had with Sandy, which is the outcome of this whole series, is to have another program and ask people on Long Island to look around them and find names of streets, of rivers, of how you know, of businesses that incorporate the Native American language because it has to be reclaimed, you know, that way. We have to give it back. And awareness is the first step to change. And I think if all of us uh, become more aware, like I was just out to my home state, Iowa, and I, I looked up and there, they had the Wakanda Country Club. Now I grew up with that name, the Wakanda Country Club. And it because of the series, oh yes, you know, obviously that's, you know, a Native American name. So um, I just want to share that with you and Sandy that, you know, that, that awareness is the first step to change, as they say. So thank you both for making us- so What's the name of the country club? Wakanda. Wakanda. So Wakanda comes from Wakanda Minabu, which means uh, our celebration. Our spirit, our uh, Wakanda Minabu is our strawberry uh, festival. Wakanda is uh, good, good. The short uh, word of that is Wakanda, good, uh, good spirit. Right? So Wakanda Minabu is the uh, full word of that, but that's where that comes from. Okay, well, thank um, you. Now Wakanda the movie, Wakanda the, the, the feast. And by the way, do you know, is there a book that that uh, looks at Long Island or and all the Indian and the Native American names, excuse me, that we use? I'm not, I didn't hear that. Is there what? Is there a book that delineates all the Native American uh, names that we do use just to... It's a list, like a book. Uh, William Wallace Tooker did that. Uh, he went the uh, place names, Indian place names on Long Island, which he published back in 1911. Oh, my God. But I have been, you know, as I said, we've been going over that, and we find a lot of uh, 
mis misinterpretations of, his, of of what he has there. Because, like I said, they're locked into, you know, we're better than you. So mm. whenever there is a, and, you know, they have this uh, Christian belief. So when you come across a word that uh, reflects a spiritual wisdom, they change that. Like they called, uh, you know, uh, Long Island Sound, they called it the devil's belt. It could not be anything referenced to something spiritual, um, you know, and so it uh, it has to reflect something evil because it's not Christian. So you have that, you have that, and you know he can't help himself. He's locked into his time frame, right? You know, so um, but what it does is it perpetuates false information, and that's why I chose those three words in particular to focus on because. Those three words are are commonly used in uh, you know in our in our vernacular of modern day, and they, those understandings need to change. Okay, well, thank you. Again, we could go on and on, but we do have to come to a close. I do want to thank, which I should have done at the top of the program, Humanities New York. Uh, for their sponsorship and the Huntington Arts Council with the re-grant from New York State Council of the Arts, Suffolk County, certainly the town of Huntington gives us such good support. And uh, last but not least, the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation, especially our Long Island contingent who supports us at this, as a state park in Huntington. So thank you again, Harry. Thank you, Sandy. 